I've always been fascinated by the study of history. Really, in its simplest form, history is no more than the life story of people. And if we think about the beginnings of Miller's Landing and eventually New Haven, we have to look at the life story of people. If we go back hundreds of years in time, there were others who's, who are not resting here, but who came to this area at a much earlier time. I'm talking about hundreds and even thousands of years ago. So I'd like to invite you to join me as we go out and we search for some clues from our past. We know that these paleo hunters were here. We find their campsites. Here in Missouri, there are a number of kill sites that have been excavated by archeologists. One of the ones that's not too far from here is at Imperial, Missouri, a place called Mastodon State Park. And here, the archeologists uncovered remains of a mastodon and also some stone tools, which suggests that the hunters and the mastodons were living at the same time historically. Well, our journey has taken us here to an area west of uh, New Haven, only a few miles, but it's a, a marvelous area. If you look behind me here, you'll notice uh, some huge rock formations. This is a, these are sandstone out, outcrops, which occur in what the local people call the Etla Knobs. And I think we can say pretty conclusively that this was an area that the early people, these early hunters and gatherers, would have frequented. Well, we've walked back to the overhang here. And as you can see, this is a, a massive rock structure that uh, has been eroded away, creating a, a cave-like appearance. This would have been a, an excellent location for people to live on a temporary or a semi-permanent basis. Um, the one particular advantage is that uh, it's a south-facing shelter. Another evidence of early man's presence in our area are the numerous burial mounds which we find along the Missouri River Valley. These high school students are on a hike to visit some mounds located just west of New Haven. There are literally thousands of burial sites along the river valley and its tributaries. They were generally built on the high bluffs overlooking the river plain. Mound building took place for hundreds of years. Some sites are a thousand years old, dating back to the Mississippian and early woodland period. Unfortunately, many burial mounds have been destroyed by agricultural practices and commercial development. Well, we're still looking for evidence of early man's presence in this area. And one thing around the New Haven area here, it's very common to find artifacts laying on the surface of the ground, right under our feet. And through the decades, uh, farmers and landscapers, excavators who turn the soil for their, their jobs, uh, often uncover these uh, remnants from these early cultures. After thousands of years of hunting and gathering, Native Americans gradually developed farming and gardening skills and began to settle in tribal communities. Within Missouri, a number of tribes emerged. Much of what today is central and southwest Missouri was occupied by Osage Indians. During the early 1700s, French voyagers traveled in dugout canoes and began exploring the Missouri River Valley. Within this valley, they found villages of Osage. Often these were the first Indians that the French met. Wanting to develop trade, the French made friends with the Osage. Seeking furs from the Indians, the French offered items of lesser value, often such things as beads and trinkets. The contact was only the first of a sequence of events. 
that would eventually cause a decline and eventual elimination of Indians from Missouri. I'm Brian Haynes. I've been an artist um, my whole life. And um, when I've been painting the Missouri landscape, uh, how could you not be interested in the people that came before? And in this area, the people that completely dominated the south side of the Missouri River were the Osage. And all the other tribes feared them uh, for many reasons, one being they were huge people. They actually, typical male, six foot five, and they still are large people in Pawhuska, Oklahoma, where they have a reservation. Um, they're just very dramatic um, people. They were agrarian, had good diet. Um, and so I've done some research for several paintings that have been commissioned to, and I found out more about them. The tools that they had and the weapons and, and the clothing um, are kind of from uh, the eastern woodland uh, history. Their oral history goes back to what may be the Iroquois. We don't know, of course, but um, that seems to make a lot of sense as they move through our area. Um, the painting behind me, for instance, was commissioned by a gentleman who collects uh, Osage artifacts specifically, and he brought to me a beautiful Osage gunstock club, it's called, that dates from 1750, and we know the date of it because of the uh, metal blade in it that was a French trade item. And so got, I got to hold this wonderful item, and he said, please just build a painting around this gunstock club, so that what a great commission to have. So I wanted to emphasize the shape of that weapon within the composition and repeat in the tr trunks of the trees and, and create a sense of menace that you might have seen if the Indians running by had spied you. Uh, but contrast that with the beauty of springtime and maybe a burst of goldfinches flying by or something like that. So, so typically the Osage were um, partly nomadic. So they would travel to hunt and in this area there were woodland bison way back and they were elk that they would hunt. Um, but they lived in longhouses. Again, not unlike the Northeastern Indians that we know of. Um, uh, but they completely d dominated the area. The Missouri Indians that our state was named from were over on the north side and stayed clear of uh, the Osage here. The other tribes that came through were the Kickapoo and the Shawnee, and they stayed clear of the Osage. And of course, when the French fur traders came in from um, uh, the 1750s to mine lead, they had to deal with the Osage and became uh, traitors with the Osage. By the time the state of Missouri became a state in 1821, the Osage were long gone. By the time Lewis and Clark came through, they were already leaving the state. Um, Auguste Chateau had an Osage trading fort all the way over on the very western part of what is now the state. And um, they felt too crowded and too pushed by settlement to uh, have anything to do with their homeland and were pushed uh, west, but they were never defeated by the U.S. government, one of the few tribes of this area that were never defeated. They were located to a reservation in Pawhuska, um, Oklahoma, and as luck would have it, the ground underneath their um, reservation is the most uh, rich source of oil in the 1930s that there ever was. For a brief period of time, the Osage tribal members were the wealthiest people on earth and it totally disrupted their tribe because people started marrying into simply to get the mineral rights below the ground. And so it did a second devastation to their culture. So when conceiving the composition behind me, I wanted to have braves moving swiftly through the forest as they would have before much European contact, before the horse, and they moved on foot, which was typical. Um, I wanted to know what it would be like if you had been standing in the woods and these braves come by and then one happens to turn and see you. Uh, I thought just thinking about it raises the hair on the back of my head. So that's what I wanted to capture in this painting is that moment of discovery that would be so frightening. Okay. Well, we're here in downtown New Haven in front of the John Coulter Memorial. Uh, this memorial was established back in the bicentennial year of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, back in 2004. 
New Haven uh, chose to recognize Coulter because Coulter spent the last few years of his life just west of here, or east of here rather, on the, along the Beth Creek. And that's where he lived, died, and is, uh, is buried. Um, John Coulter was the third man hired by Meriwether Lewis at Maysville, Kentucky in 1803. And he went all the way to the Pacific Ocean with the Lewis and Clark expedition. He was the only man excused from the expedition in August, 15, uh, August 15th of 1806. He went back into the mountains out west with two of his friends, Hancock and Dixon, and they were going to trap for beaver. He ended up coming back up here to New Haven, which was known as Miller's Landing at the time. He came back up here to Booth, Booth Creek, and uh, he, he settled, he got married, he had two children. He joined the militia with Nathan Boone for the War of 1812 in, uh, in 1812. And unfortunately, he got jaundiced and passed away in May of 1812. And he's buried here close to New Haven. So where is John Coulter buried? Most of the early historians thought that Coulter was buried somewhere east of here near the little railroad community of Dundee and also a community called Newport. There there was a, a grave site on top of a, a, a bluff or a ridge and there was a cemetery there that um, had been used by some of the er very early settlers. And in 19... 26, when the railroad was double tracking, the railroad being right at the base of the hill here, a good portion of that cemetery was destroyed. And as a result of that, some felt that probably John Coulter's grave had been destroyed there. However, this new evidence showing the stone of Hiram Coulter here on this site has now led many historians to believe that Coulter was buried here in this cemetery. Again, there's no conclusive evidence as to exactly where Coulter is buried. My name is Dennis Coulter, and I am a great, great, great grandson of legendary explorer and mountain man John Coulter. First time I had ever heard about John Coulter, I was in the third grade in Jefferson City, Missouri, when our teacher read us the story about Coulter's capture and subsequent escape from the Blackfeet. I was fascinated by that. My other classmates wanted to know immediately if I was related. And I said, no, I was not related. I had no knowledge of John Coulter prior to that. Fast forward 25 years into the 80s, I had married a young lady named Terry Heyman from New Haven, Missouri. Her parents were Roscoe and Myrtle Heyman. Myrtle Heyman began saving clippings from the New Haven newspaper from a series that they were doing, they were doing about John Coulter. Well, one of those clippings showed the, grand, the grandchildren of John Coulter, the children of his son Hiram, and lo and behold, there was the name Nathan R. Coulter, which was the same name as my grandfather. I had started doing a little research and it turned out that the same Nathan Coulter who was descended from Hiram and John Coulter was my, my great-grandfather, Nathan Coulter. Hello folks, my name is Jim Peters from Washington, Missouri. And some people call me an artist, but I call myself a painter. Anyway, I was commissioned back in 2006 to paint a picture of John Coulter. Well, I had to do some research on John Coulter, who traveled with the expedition of Lewis and Clark. Of course, you know that. This is a painting that I did uh, uh, back in 2006 of John Coulter and after doing research, what I came up with is that he settled on a spot at the Beth Creek east of New Haven. So I took my boat up there and took some photos and, and figured out uh, the fall of the year would be the most colorful. That's why I have that. And then, then I had to go to a, a person by the name of Crosby Brown. Now, he's an expert on this era. He has a canoe like this, that's a dugout canoe. Now it's not like the Indians did because it's, it's, uh, it's chopped out really, really fine, uh, thin, it's, it's thin. So 
that's probably the way John had because it's a lighter boat to be used. Now this particular spot is supposed to be Beth Creek where it enters into the Missouri River. John's uh, uh, outfit here I got from Crosby which is authentic in those years. I pictured him coming back from a deer hunt and the, the small buck he has was shot by an official rifle that was used in those years. And also the, uh, the clothing that he wore was more than likely what he used. Now to get the waves in this uh, creek here, uh, it was winter time and I, I couldn't go up the river with my boat and I couldn't go down to the river with my boat. So I went in my bathtub and took a wooden spoon and, and went like this in the water to get the effect of these waves here. <laughs> Well, when the first settlers began arriving here in the Missouri Territory in the uh, early 1800s, their first order of business was to acquire some property. Now, some of them who had some financial means were able to buy property. Many of them did not, however. Some were renters and some became simply squatters. They'd find a piece of ground and uh, simply set up uh, their home there. And uh, so the first business was to build a cabin. And in the background here, you can see a a typical uh, cabin that would have been built uh, from native materials, probably from mostly from white oak logs. And uh, this would have been uh, the combination of efforts of maybe several families that would have uh, worked together in order to establish a, um, a, at least a temporary residence. The era of steamboating began in the east in the late 1700s. St. Louis saw its first steamboat arrive in 1817. Two years later, the steamboat Independence became the first boat to travel the Missouri River, passing by what today would be New Haven. Seeing a need to provide fuel for the wood-burning steamers, wood yards sprang up along the river. About 80 miles upstream from the mouth of the Missouri River, an enterprising landowner named Philip Miller piled some firewood along the banks of the river. Being a good deep water location, the boats began docking to purchase the wood. Miller's Landing was barned. The year was 1836. On the heels of Daniel Boone's epic passage through the Cumberland Gap in 1775, Philip Miller's father, Stephen Miller, led his young family from Maryland to Kentucky, where they settled near the Boone family. In 1799, as a young man, Philip Miller accompanied Daniel Boone and his family to the Missouri Territory. Some years later, he acquired land east of present-day New Haven. In 1836, he purchased the land which would become Miller's Landing. There are only a few accounts describing Philip Miller the man. One account was written by Samuel Rogers, a circuit-riding preacher who wrote in an autobiography about a visit to Miller's Landing in 1840. He wrote, Here I found Philip Miller, a native of Nicholas County, Kentucky. Miller was a man of rare good sense and exerted a happy influence in his neighborhood. End of quote. This represents one of the few historic references that we have to the founder of New Haven, Philip Miller. Steamboats brought people and commerce to Miller's Landing. First settlers from the southeast arrived, some bringing their slaves. Later German immigrants arrived in large numbers. Farms and new businesses sprang up. Miller's Landing became a major stopping point for hundreds of steamboats traversing the muddy Missouri. Not to be overlooked, were the arrival of African Americans. They became an important part of the local economy, many of them working as farmhands, house servants, day laborers, and even dockhands on the steamboats.
was the Citizens Bank of New Haven asked me to do a piece of work uh, depicting the early uh, period of time in New Haven. And so we chose the early Miller's Landing time, the Miller's Landing days and so forth, and uh, did some research and uh, found that uh, New Haven was founded, and it was, by Philip Miller. And the early days of, Phil of uh, Miller's Landing, uh, Miller's Landing was a stopover on the river. It was totally involved with the river. So the piece I have behind me shows um, a common day uh, that you might have found uh, in, in uh, Miller's Landing, some trading, people stopping over, a steamboat stopping by to buy more wood and so forth to continue their journey and so forth. Uh, Miller's Landing continued on this path till about 1856 and in 1856 New Haven was incorporated. Primarily in order for the railroad to go through the town had to be incorporated and so forth. So uh, you have a period of time there of about 20 years when uh, the steamboat, the river travel was the primary influence on uh, New Haven. Um, great little stopover, uh, wonderful little town. Uh, all of these little towns along the Missouri River, if you'll notice, they're about 15 miles apart. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is the railroad had to stop about every 15 miles to get water. But, of course, a steamboat would burn up uh, many, many cords of wood between, like, Washington and uh, New Haven in that period of time. So uh, um, uh, they, they, they consumed a tremendous amount of wood and so forth, and uh, Mr. Uh, Miller uh, sort of capitalized on that particular situation by providing wood for them. We're standing in the front yard of a, a home which the locals refer to as the Miller House. Um, this house was, uh, is significant in that uh, it was probably the first brick home built here in New Haven. Uh, it was built around 1856 and uh, built by Philip Miller's son Samuel. Now Samuel had the unique name of Samuel Clark Washington Miller. Um, we're going to simplify that and just simply call him Samuel. But uh, Samuel built this uh, pre-Civil War. Samuel was the tenth of twelve children born to Philip and his first wife Naomi Richardson. Uh, he was born in 1815 and he built this uh, after his father's death. His father died in in 1845 uh, and uh, it's interesting to note that in, in, uh, in Philip's will and last testament he, uh, he mentions the uh, family in the first paragraph he uh, provides for his wife his second wife Lucy who their marriage would uh, eventually yield nine additional children but uh, the next paragraph uh, directed um, what uh, he wanted to provide for Samuel. And uh, undoubtedly Samuel was one of his favorites because uh, Samuel was willed 160 acres, a quarter section of land. The rest of the children were provided with uh, money and some land as well. So it, uh, it suggests that Philip Miller was a fairly wealthy man in order to be able to provide all this for his living children at that time. We go on to Samuel. Uh, Samuel was, uh, played a significant role in the establishment of New Haven. Uh, it's, uh, it's to be noted that uh, Philip Miller, of course, was the founder of, of Miller's Landing. But Samuel, in 1856, about the same time that this home was built, uh, was party to a plat that was recorded in the county seat in Union that uh, actually established the, the town of New Haven. Uh, this plat, uh, which uh, had a, a layout of all of the, what today we would call downtown New Haven, um, provided that uh, this uh, land then could be purchased. And so in a sense, this was kind of a real estate deal that uh, Samuel was involved in. But at the same time, it, uh, 
indicated that uh, this new town was to be named New Haven, which formerly had been Miller's Landing. So uh, we have to admit that Philip Miller's role and Samuel Miller's role were extremely important in the history of this community. Well, we've walked up to the Goodridge Miller Cemetery, which is just about a, a mile east of New Haven. And this is the burial site of Philip Miller. Philip Miller, of course, it was the founder of Miller's Landing, which eventually became New Haven. And unfortunately, his, his uh, gravestone is, has fallen and is broken here. But uh, if we take a good look at the stone, we can see his name here. It's Philip, P-I-H-H-I-P Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, died January 29th, 1845. Now, his second wife, Lucy, is buried next to him here. Here's Lucy's grave. Lucy lived about 10 years further. She, she died in uh, 1855. And so we have a number of the members of the Miller's family buried here. Now, the Philip Miller story is a fascinating story in that he was born in Pennsylvania, came to Kentucky with his family as a young boy, eventually came to Missouri, he uh, was neighbors and friends with the Boone family, Daniel and Rebecca Boone. And so he came to Missouri in, in 1799 when the Boones came here. He eventually went back to Kentucky. He married uh, Naomi Richardson. When Miller met uh, Naomi Richardson, uh, here in the Missouri Territory, they married. They went back to Kentucky for a number of years and uh, started a family. But about, around nine, about 1805 in that neighborhood, they came back to Missouri and set up residence here. Uh, Naomi and Philip had 12 children. She passed away in about 1822. We're not exactly certain. There's no exact death date. And then uh, Philip married Lucy McIntyre, and this is her gravesite here. Lucy and Philip had an additional nine children. So Philip Miller had a total of 21 children. As we enter into the uh, mid-1800s here in Miller's Landing, New Haven, um, we have, of course, the steamboat activity down here by the river. That was still very, very important. But there was going to be a new uh, com competitor to the steamboat, and that was the emergence of railroad transportation. Um, by 1855, the Pacific Railroad had reached New Haven. It had been built from St. Louis westward, was going to be extended all the way to Kansas City. And of course the railroad then was going to compete with the steamboats and eventually surpass them in terms of importance. And by the late 1800s, the steamboat era had pretty well ended. As we know, the Missouri River is the predominant uh, focus here in New Haven, Missouri. That is where the river cuts through here through this glorious town, and that's how we began, is by this mighty mo. So the Wolf Mill Company was built, of course, to the production of the barrels and everything. The, the Tilda Clara, which is the horse-powered boat, brought supplies and everything that the town needed for transport. The steamship down below, actually is really not reminiscent of New Haven, Missouri. It's more of my mother's imagination. She loved the steamboats, absolutely loved the steamboats. And I'm sure the steamboats came by and you had the, you had the visitors, you had the people stepping off uh, to view our beautiful town. Down behind me uh, graces the Annabelle Chapel, which is the first uh, 
African American church here in New Haven, Missouri. Uh, I remember many a days when I was a child and I would go up to that church and watching the women uh, washing the windows. That's when I learned that you wash the windows with vinegar and newspaper. So that was always entertaining. Uh, of course, the elementary school, which is now the museum for New Haven, Missouri, which is a great place to come and visit. It has lots of history and they have totally redone the building. Um, I went to school there. <laughs> My brothers and sisters went to school there and swang all the swings. Um, then you, of course, go up to the crest of the hill, which is the Philip Miller home, the founder of New Haven, Missouri. And then out on the bluffs of New Haven, past the old Kelly residence, which is the large brick home, is known as the Kelly residence here in New Haven, but actually was a girls' school. Uh, past that, we called, uh, actually, Hobo's Mountain, which is actually the cemetery up there. Uh, where Philip Miller is buried. Blue House in the center, that was the original home when my mother, Dee Dan, moved to New Haven. That is the home that she purchased uh, back in 1971 and moved our family here from St. Louis, Missouri, off of Lindbergh. Then, of course, down below, you have the old blacksmith's uh, shop. The rest of the hill that goes up again with the four brick buildings is Wall Street. Well, the, one of the most predominant streets other than Maine in New Haven, Missouri. And of course, we grace up uh, through the, all the brick buildings up there that are still there today, including our wonderful Alan Bell, that is uh, our wonderful potter here in town. And then down below is my mother. You see the pink houses. And that's where it kind of all began when she moved from uh, the house on the hill, the blue house on the hill, she purchased uh, her first B&B &B down here on the landing. Um, that it was a, Originally, it was across the levee, and it got moved over and set, and she purchased that house for $1 back in the day. <laughs> and she totally put her heart and soul into it, and that was her dream and her vision. And then later, this house which I am gracious to know is bought by a dear friend of hers, Steve Batran and Kathy, late Kathy, God bless her. And they're here restoring this one that my mother purchased about in 1990, 1991, and doing a beautiful renovation job, and I'm very blessed to be here. My name is David, David Smith. I'm from New Haven. Uh, we're out here at the Baltimore Cemetery. What I'd like to talk about is, is my uh, great-grandfather that's uh, buried here, served in the Civil War. He was a slave in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. The person that plantation he was on, uh, on his deathbed, he freed him. And for some reason, my great-grandfather made it to uh, Trelor and he, he was a farmer over there. He worked as a farm laborer until he was 30 years old when he joined the Civil War. And he joined the Company E, the 49th Division of the Infantry. They were basically located in uh, New Orleans. And uh, he got injured in Pittsburgh, Mississippi. He came back to, uh, to Missouri and he lived to be 90-some years old. 